PolyVenture. Uh, my name is Josh Franco. I appreciate you joining. Uh, this workshop uh, series explores how games relate to uh, concepts in political science. I'll be live streaming games such as Catan Universe, Risk, uh, Civilization, and others to discuss how different elements of the game relate to political science. Now, note that these workshops are live streamed on Twitch on Wednesdays, so from 7.30 to 8. And feel free to go to polyventure.com to watch the live stream. So our workshop schedule for the fall, uh, we started a few weeks ago. So first was the seven concepts and then communication and information. Today we'll be discussing strategy, both cooperative and competitive. And then the following weeks we'll discuss moves, networks, uh, take a break for Thanksgiving, uh, and then uh, probability and signals. So appreciate you taking the time. Now, uh, if you're interested, you can watch the summer recordings uh, that introduces this workshop, talks about uh, applications to existing games, and it's kind of a way of building up uh, the workshop itself as to what you see today. So it was like a good uh, initial run, and then we'll keep going from there. And again, you can watch the, uh, the live stream switch. So let's go ahead and jump to week uh, four, which I'll, let me just rename this really fast so that we're on the same page, and about strategy. <clears throat> okay. So our learning objectives for this workshop are the following. First is that by the end of it, you should be able to define what strategy is. Secondly is to explain how strategy occurs in a game. And then lastly, explain how strategy occurs with a real life political example. And recall that we have seven concepts that we're exploring. The first one's communication. Uh, second is information. Strategies are third. Moves and network are fourth and fifth, respectively. And then lastly, probability and signals. Now, the reason I focus on these concepts because I feel like they're pretty general and it gives us a sense of, of co concepts that are played, that exist in the real world and that can be applied both to our friendly games that we play as well as uh, politics at the local state and particularly at the national and international levels. And so I'm excited to be able to describe these concepts and then demonstrate it with a, a computer game or an, uh, an app and then show how uh, it can also apply to the real world. So with that, the concept and focus for today is that of strategy. <clears throat> now, we call that uh, strategy consists of two elements, right? Cooperative or competitive. Now, cooperative strategies are where you work with other players to accomplish a goal, while a competitive strategy uh, is where you work alone or instrumentally with other players to accomplish a goal. Now, most of the times when we think of strategies, we're thinking in a competitive framework, uh, largely because many games that we uh, uh, see uh, in the real world appear competitive on their face. So like, for example, a soccer match, obviously there's two teams trying to compete, uh, football matches, uh, baseball matches. We just saw the World Series in with the Atlanta Braves winning for the first time, like in, I don't know, 25 years or something. Um, cricket matches, rugby matches, go down the list of all the matches. Most of the times we see that in a competitive framework because it's two teams. But if we relax just the general idea that there's two opposing sides, Underneath that general strategy is a cooperative strategy because the teams have to work together uh, within themselves amongst their players in order to be their best and hopefully defeat uh, their opponents. So there are cooperative elements in games just as much as there are competitive elements in games. It just depends on the level and the focus on which you give it. So uh, with that, let's go ahead and uh, think about how we can operationalize this uh, concept within a game. Uh, both cooperative and competitive. So what we'll do is uh, bring up my trusty. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm doing two things at once here. Uh, let's pull up uh, our game of Clash Royale. So let's get rid of that. I wish I had some background music starting to play. Okay, let me hide this screen. Here we go. I make it work. So here's my Clash uh, Royale um, setup. Uh, as you can see, there's a couple things I need to do. So I'll just go ahead and first start with opening my chest, which is always fun. <laughs> uh, the ice golem, that icy slow guy, good stuff. Uh, what I'm gonna do is play a game that is competitive. So it's gonna be me versus a, some randomly assigned player somewhere in the world. So let's check it out. I should have checked my deck. My deck is the cards I get to choose, but we'll have at it. All right. So let's have at it. Let's see what's going on. All right, quick start. All right, I'm going. Let's see what's 
happening? Uh oh. Alright, so as you can see here, I'm competing with this uh, red player. And the idea is that we need to get some points by knocking down their towers. So I'm doing pretty good so far. But we'll see how it evolves. Uh, the match lasts for three minutes and you go up to an additional one. I think two or three minutes after that. Uh, and that's just the nature of the game. So this is competitive. It's me versus someone else. We're both trying to accomplish the same objective against each other, which is knock down our towers. Uh, obviously, we're willing to put in some resources here uh, in the, the form of the elixir at the bottom that you see, um, as well as uh, the general need to knock down your opponent's offensive characters because you don't want them coming after your tower. So progress is slowly and surely being made here. Uh, I'm doing pretty well, so I can take a kind of a less aggressive approach, but it just depends on... Alright. Oh, that was unexpected. Actually doing pretty well. <laughs> oh, see that knight? That always, the jousting is just so strong. I will right, see how we go here. It's close. Alright. I think the other player is going to come on pretty strong. All right, we're in a good spot. Mm, not a good spot. <laughs> Gotta hold out for 10 seconds here. I think we'll got it. All right. Let's go. Looks good, friends. <laughs> There's a little lag between what's happening on my phone and the game itself, but victory has been achieved, friends. So this is a competitive match. Right, my strategy was to defeat my opponent uh, by knocking down as many towers as I can. They have three. Now, it's the same game, right? Clash Royale, um, which is a very popular one. I came across it because my buddy uh, Lynette, <laughs> she brought it to my attention, then Saul. Uh, but you can also have uh, friendly matches. And this is helpful because you get to see then how uh, you can work together with somebody to try to knock down someone else's tower. So we'll give it a moment here to load. And then they have this party function, so I'm going to go ahead and click on that. And what we'll see here in the party is that you have some options. You can like practice, or you can have a two-by-two two battle. And what I want to demonstrate is that the two-by-two two battle is an example of a, com a cooperative game and a cooperative strategy because you obviously want to work with your randomly assigned teammate so that you can uh, win. So we're going to do a quick match. And you'll see here that there's now two towers on each side. And my teammate is the other blue. And they're starting off pretty fast, so we'll see what they do. And I'll do my best to compliment my team member. All right. So here, there's two on each side. Our goals are the same, which are to knock down the other uh, towers. Things are looking pretty good here so far. See what evolves. All right, that was great. Yes. So my fellow teammate and I were, we can't talk to each other. I don't think we can. No, we can only send emojis out to everyone. So here we're waiting. So I'm trying to accumulate my elixir, which is the purple stuff at the bottom. Um, that's basically a resource. And I'm assuming that my, my teammates also doing that, which, He's done, or they've done. All 
right. All right. So he put up a defensive um, electric tower. Now I have my air cannon doing the trick. So, so far we're working out pretty well. Um, maybe minus this instance. All right, that was good defensive play. Let me put this into action. I always go for my barrel. It's like one of my go-to. All right, so we're doing pretty good here. Uh, he's not wasting away his troops. I'm not wasting away my troops. Um, given how many items are being played, it looks like on the other side, the red team, that maybe one of the two players isn't actually there. Um, because if they were, they would be moving a lot faster. There'd, be, there'd basically be more red units doing um, involved in the game. So... All right, let's see how this goes. There we go. So by working together, we've won. So me being Bobcat one and my counterpart. So he left the chat right away. There was no like, hey, good job or what's you know going on. Um, so competitive, this is a f example of a cooperative game. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and put this on pause and come back to our presentation. Hopefully you enjoyed that playing of the game. <laughs> Clash Royale, a good way to spend a few minutes every day if you just wanna take your mind off of most things. Uh, so with that, let's take a look at an, a real life example of strategy and um, something that happened just today, which was in the United States Senate, uh, there was an effort by the majority leader, uh, uh, Senator Chuck Schumer, a uh, Democrat from New York, to uh, bring forward the John Lewis Voting Rights Bill. Now, this bill would help to remedy uh, uh, an issue that was created when the Supreme Court a number of years ago uh, basically struck down a portion of the voting rights law uh, that said that states that adopt uh, election procedures or policies or laws, they if they have a history of discriminatory actions against minority communities and groups, that it would need to get clearance or pre-clearance by the federal government. In other words, if the state was going to alter how it administers federal elections for federal positions, then the federal, then that state, after passing that law, would need to get approval from the Department of Justice that would uh, verify that it met the standards of the Voting Rights Act. Well, the Supreme Court um, struck that part down and now we've seen states uh, over the past number of years now adopt new laws and procedures that uh, many view as uh, either discri outright discriminatory or at least make it more difficult, particularly for uh, minority communities and underrepresented groups in the political and the voting process from being able to actually participate in the voting process. So what we'll do is we'll go ahead and listen to um, uh, the rec uh, see if it actually plays. We'll double check. So I'll go ahead and have this read to us for a few moments uh, just to get some background on it. Hopefully it hopefully it goes through, the audio goes through, but we'll see right now. So the title of this article is Senate GOP Blocks Latest Dem Push for Voting Reform. And we'll go ahead and highlight a few of these and see if it plays for us. Hopefully. Senate GOP Blocks Latest Dem Push for Voting Reform. Congress. Alaska's Lisa Merkel. This is our fourth, and I think final, attempt to find partners across the aisle who will defend the right of every American to vote, said Senator Jeff Merkley, Dior. We've given it every possible effort over now five months, for different strategies. It's not going to happen, so we're going to have to do it with 50 members. And we're going to have to sit down and decide how we're going to do it. That's not necessarily the conclusion Senator Joe Manchin, DW.Virginia, is coming to, after extensive outreach to the other side of the aisle on voting. We've got Lisa Murkowski, we just need nine more, Manchin said. We need other people to be talking to each other and find a pathway forward. It can't just be one or two people talking to both sides. The Lewis bill vote is perhaps the starkest example of the filibuster's status as the key obstacle to Democrats' hopes of passing a new elections measure after a flurry of state-level laws they say are designed to restrict ballot access. 
The Lewis legislation at its core restores a provision of the 1965 Voting Rights Act that would re-establish so-called preclearance requirements for jurisdictions with a history of discrimination. Those requirements were effectively neutered by a Supreme Court decision in 2013, Shelby County v. Holder, for relying on what the High Court ruled was an outdated formula to determine which jurisdictions were subject to preclearance requirements. But before the Supreme Court ruling, the core provisions of the Voting Rights Act had been renewed several times over the preceding decades, including a 25-year extension approved by a 98-0 Senate vote in 2006. That sort of large bipartisan approval will not come this year, with Republicans nearly universally united against the Lewis bill. Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell ahead of the vote described the legislation as a Democratic power grab that would let Attorney General Merrick Garland dictate voting procedures. The Voting Rights Act is still in effect, McConnell said. The courts haven't struck down that law. It's simply false to suggest otherwise. The Supreme Court simply ruled that there was no evidence supporting the continuation of 40-year-old practices that were designed in the mid-1960s. Wednesday's vote comes after Murkowski reached a compromise with Manchin and Senators Patrick Leahy, DVT, and Dick Durbin, DL, on the language for the bill. Majority Leader Chuck Schumer voted against the bill for procedural reasons, thus reserving himself the right to call it up again. But Murkowski said that while the changes were helpful, they're not sufficient to convince most of her Republican colleagues. They're not enough to get more Republicans on to allow it to be this bipartisan bill, so I've got some work to do, Murkowski said in an interview. I accept that. I need to keep up my level of engagement with the colleagues that we've been working with, but also to try to do more one-on-one -on -one with Republican colleagues. So the article goes on to describe, you know, this back and forth. But if you think about it in the abstract, right, with our content of uh, our concept and focus of strategy, right, we see both cooperative and competitive elements. So the the cooperative element here is that there's efforts to try to bring individuals who are quote unquote across the aisle. So the Democratic majority and at least a few of its members publicly, uh, according to this article, are reaching out to members of the Republican Party in the Senate to say, hey, would you be supportive? of these uh, this language and this legislation or uh, what would be something that gets you to vote for this bill and um, so that would be a cooperative element where we see two different part two members of two different parties trying to work together through these differences now the competitive element here is understanding that there's this balance of there's this competition for power that exists between the political parties and for most people they kind of turn off to it because like oh that's just politics but in reality it's just uh, two different entities groups sets of people who have a, a difference of opinion on on things and they um have uh you know they're, they're competing for who gets the control who has power and so this is an important element of when we think about what's going on in our um in our society today because it essentially says uh, that we need to think about uh, strategy in both the competitive sense, which is pretty common for us, and when you think about things in the cooperative sense. And so my hope is that as you're thinking about this concept, you realize that when you read an article like this, don't get turned off right away, like, oh, this is just politics, it's not for me. But kind of take a step back and say, okay, what's one, what, are, what are some of the concepts that are being brought out here? And one of them is a strategy. Like, there's a strategy by the Democratic Party to say that we need to, uh, to advance this piece of legislation, whether or not it has... Uh, uh, political slash uh, um, uh, policy benefits. Uh, obviously, there's probably there, but at the same time, it's about voting rights, which, as the article points out, <laughs> most people were almost there. It was universally supported just uh, 15 years ago. And so to see that uh, stark change over a short period of time kind of makes people think, well, maybe there is a competition here that um, can't be rec can't, that unfortunately cannot be reconciled. So then, as uh, quoted by one of the senators, well, we're going to have to do it on our own. Um, obviously, there's a lot of back and forth in these kinds of situations, but in any political situation, as you read these articles, engage, listen to the news, ask your ask yourself the question: What's the strategy here? Like, are they being competitive or they're being cooperative? And most of the times they're being competitive because they're vying for political power, political influence, control of processes, and they're being cooperative because they see some value in that process or that they have similar preferences on a policy or legal or constitutional issue and they're willing to kind of work through it and figure things out. So with that, hopefully this was um, 
uh, interesting and illuminating as we uh, discussed the concept of strategy and we saw it uh, applied in both a cooperative uh, and a competitive sense in both the, uh, the game Clash Royale and then in real life with uh, the most recent action and uh, the voting rights bill being uh, not advanced in the Senate due to uh, filibusters uh, by the uh, minority party. So with that, I hope you uh, picked up a few things. Take care and have a great night.